Okay, so let's face it. If you're watching this video, it's because you cannot get any real work done without having to rely on some sort of tutorial. Whether that's a video on YouTube or some step-by-step -step rhythm content online, you just can't get it done by yourself. Now, if that's the case, that comes down to two main problems. Either one, you don't have the experience required to actually work on your own yet, which means that you lack the fundamental knowledge required to even do any sort of programming. During my free time, I like to browse help forums and help people out with their programming bugs and problems. And it's not uncommon to see a post like this. Hey, I'm building the next Facebook, but I'm stuck on this. And then you look at their problem and it turns out it's something actually very simple. Either they don't understand how conditional statement works, or if they're using Python, it's usually like an indentation problem somewhere. So then that brings me up to my next question and I ask, okay, well, how long have you been programming for? And then they reply with something like, well, this is my second day programming. And then it all kind of makes sense, right? You cannot build something as complicated as Facebook having programmed for two days. It's just not going to work. You need to really understand your fundamentals. That's being your loops, your if statements, your functions, your classes, all the fundamentals. You have to understand that before you can go ahead and work on your own and actually build something with those skills. Now, there's nothing wrong with being eager and really trying to dig in there and build something really cool. And that's awesome. But I really think that you have to understand your fundamental first. So if that's you and you're in that boat, I recommend that you go and actually learn your fundamentals right you're going to watch tutorials for a while and that's fine learn your fundamentals and then come back to this video because i think you get a lot out of it now if you're on the opposite side of the spectrum and you've actually been programming for a while now but you still have to rely on tutorials to actually get any real work done then that's likely because you haven't learned one secret now this secret is going to make it so that you never have to watch a tutorial again and i'm serious about that you'll never have to watch a tutorial again to get any work done and that secret is documentation. Now, if you have no idea what documentation is, then you're in the right place. This is the right video for you. And if you do know what documentation is, but you look at it and you're like, I, I just don't understand what this is saying, then you're also in the right place because I'm gonna teach you how to read documentation. Now, in case you fall in the boat of not knowing what documentation is, documentation is just some form of content that tells you how to use that thing you're using. And that's whether that's a library, a framework, a programming language, whatever that is, it tells you exactly how to use it. And the best part is that it's actually written by the people who made the technology because they know exactly how the technology they made works and they're telling you how it works so you know how to use it yourself. And this is a really interesting point because if you think about it like who's actually teaching the people who make the programming tutorials how to do the stuff that they're doing right so uh, this comes from documentation if you know how to read documentation yourself you don't have to rely on any tutorial anywhere else because you know exactly how the thing you're using actually works and that's the entire point of knowing how to read and use documentation so now let's hop over to the computer and let me show you how to read documentation Okay, so let's start with an example. Now, this is Pillow. Pillow is a library that you've probably seen before. It's pretty popular in Python. However, keep in mind that what I'm gonna show you doesn't just apply to Python. It can be used with any language, right? It's not specific to, to a specific language. Reading documentation applies to any language, any library, any framework, and so on. So let's take a look at this. The first thing to know when like starting to read documentation is how do you actually find this stuff? So this is for Pillow, but for example, uh, it's just a matter of looking things up, right? So I literally just typed in pillow and then uh, docs. If I do that, search in whatever engine you want. I like DuckDuckGo. Um, here it is, pillow docs, and that's docs for pillow, and it brings us to this page. So this is the documentation for pillow. Now, pillow, like I said, it, it's a library and it's actually used for uh, manipulating uh, images, uh, whether that's like resizing them, adding text to them. It just has a bunch of features for basically just working with images. So um, for example, let's say we're starting out. So where do we actually start reading this documentation, especially considering how big it is? Like documentation for pillow is, is very big and it has a lot of stuff in it. The first thing to know is the documentation usually follows the structure of a program and that's because any library framework or programming language that you're learning is actually a program in itself right it's, it's a program so that's why i say it's important for you to actually know your basics before you even start reading documentation so with that said where do we actually start with this stuff well um like any documentation there's usually some sort of examples and the examples i think is the first way to go and you'll notice that for different documentation types there's like just various ways of 
uh, doing stuff. However, they like the developer decides to actually write the documentation right. So look, I found a tutorial, which is great because the tutorial will show you examples. Now you might be wondering, okay, well that's a tutorial and I'm trying to get away from tutorials. Yes, that's right. But at the beginning, like you have to know how to use the actual library. So sometimes it'll be labeled as tutorial. Other times it'll be labeled as examples. It's all different, but you want to have a feel of how the actual documentation works to begin with before you start using it. So if I look at that, let me see what that says. Okay. So these are exactly what I was looking for. In other words, it's just examples of how the library actually works. Um, we have from pill import image. This is just importing the image module from pill. That's all he's doing there. Um, and they show you examples with it. So this is usually what I'll start. Maybe I'll read through this. Uh, I, I might not read the entire thing. I might read parts of it that are specific to the things I want to do. Uh, but then eventually you get to do specific things. Like I said before, pillow is used to work with images. So something I might want to do in an image, if I want to go ahead and read this, I don't, I don't even know if it might be here or not, but something I want to do, for example, is I want to go ahead and maybe resize an image because that's something you probably do very commonly. So where do how do we figure out how to do that? Well, you'll notice the documentation actually has a search bar and this is pretty common across multiple online documentations um some might not have it and if it doesn't it's just result to searching the page itself you know that's uh control f on windows and linux or command f on mac to figure out like basically just search whatever you want on the page right very very straightforward so in this example i'm gonna go ahead and search for resize here because let's say i want to go ahead and resize my image so if I search for resize, I get a bunch of stuff here, a bunch of results. Um, so let me start from the top. I see this, this is what I want. So let's check this out. This is a method according to this documentation and uh, it requires an image object. So I can see that I have to call this on an image object and dot, dot resize. So that's how I resize stuff. So if I click on that, here we go. So we get a lot more information about it. Um, I see again that this requires an image and then that resize method takes all these parameters. So right away, I already know how to resize an image because as long as I have an image object, I can go ahead and call that resize method and basically do whatever I need to do with my image resizing in this case and good documentation will often have stuff like this it'll tell you exactly the parameters that it needs for example here we have size resample all this stuff and more more likely than not it'll tell you what it returns so with this information knowing what it requires to actually call that object on or, or the, that function on and knowing what that returns um, it gives you a really good indication of how to put things together and i think that's like the starting point so for example, I've never actually used a uh, pillow for rotating stuff before, but since it's an image library, I'm assuming it has functions for rotating. Um, so let's say I want to go ahead and rotate an image. I could just kind of go through here and figure out like where that is, right? And keep scrolling down or I can use a search bar. So let me see, I'm gonna go to the search bar real quick and I'm gonna put like rotate. Oh, okay. Rotate comes up. Okay. So we have rotate. Oh, cool. See, so we have rotate 180. Uh, I noticed that these are capitalized. So these are probably attributes of a class. And this is why I, I, I say it's important to know the structure of a program because I know, okay, well, if it's capitalized, it's probably some sort of attribute that calls a function maybe. Uh, so let's see what that does. If I click on that, right. So it's just an attribute of the image class, which means, which means I could literally just call this attribute on the actual um, image itself and they'll rotate it 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees. So you get the gist. That's a lot of the point, right? Is knowing exactly how that works. So because I know I need an image object to call this rotate attribute, um, then I probably need to go ahead and figure out how that works too. So we could go over here to the search of docs and I'm gonna search image. So if I search for image, here we come image module. So I know that has to be the class, right? It's the very top of it. Um, there was also, if I go back really quick, I saw an image class, which is probably the same thing. So let me click on that as well. Right. So here we have the image class, right? So it's a class image. Uh, it tells you exactly what this does. It represents an image object, right? And this is the image object that we need to do the stuff that we looked for before. We needed to resize images. We needed to rotate images, right? So that's what we need. So because of that, we can see that that's what we need. So we can create an image object basically. And then it also gives us some options here for open, new, and from bytes. Basically a way of creating the images. I'm assuming those are, if I click on them, Right. It tells me here image style open opens the identified given image file and then returns an image object. 
So that would be a great way to basically start that image object to get your image file going. I guess that, that's the way it goes. So that's a lot of written documentation. Again, it's knowing the structure of a program because by knowing the structure of a program, the class, what is a method, what is a function, I could really easily navigate this thing and do exactly whatever I want to do with this library. So that's why I say it's so important to know your basics first. Now let's look at another example. Um, let's look at a Java. Uh, let's do a Java array list. That'd be cool. So if I look at Java array list here, um, here's the documentation for Java array list docs.oracle.com. If I click on that, um, here we go. We have documentation for it. It tells you about the, it tells you that here, uh, resizable array and implementation of the list interface. Now, if you're looking at things like this, you might have absolutely no idea what it means. And that's okay. Because again, that probably means that you don't have the required knowledge to go forward with this, like really learn your basics first and then come to this. Now let's say, why would you even want to look at the array list documentation? Well, if you know what an array list is, you know that you have in Java, like common arrays, right? So let's say I go ahead and open up a new file here, make this bigger for you guys here. And then I have some sort of array, right? Um, a R R let's just call it array. Um, and then for an array object, obviously you have, you still have to create it, but let's say you have an array object and you want to go at element zero and then basically go ahead and put something in that element, right? Let's say I want to go ahead and put, I don't know, let's say it's a list of strings. So I put one, whatever it might be. Now you'll notice that if you start maybe using an array list, maybe you find out about array list recently and you haven't used them before. If you do something like this for an array list, that won't work. It's just, it's just not going to work. Right. Oh, and semicolon. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not going to work. So if I scroll down here, um, how do we add stuff to an array list? So here we go. So I can see the, this is add function. Um, it's a method, right? Method and description. So this add method here, uh, returns a Boolean. So that's probably not what I want because uh, I, I don't want to go ahead and return a Boolean or I might, it says append the specified elements to the end of the list. So in this case, that's actually what I want. And it returns you a Boolean, uh, which is a little weird, but I guess it may be, maybe it's a Boolean saying that, oh, it has been added or whatever that is. Uh, but the point of the matter is that you get to see exactly what each function does and what each function returns. So by seeing that you can go ahead and add something to an array list. So I know for an array list, how can I go ahead and put something in there? Let me see. It's empty, remove. Um, so I could go ahead and go through this and search for it, uh, like by line by line, or since I kind of know what I'm looking for, I could use control F because in this case, if I go up, there is no search bar here. Right? So let's see, how can I, uh, let's put maybe, no, that's not it. Um, sometimes you just won't get it. You gotta look through it until you find it. Excuse the buzz in the background, um, but but that's the overall thing for um, for looking for documentation here. So I know I want to put it at a specific index, right? So what can you find? I cannot search for it. Let me see. I have add. Oh, okay. So it was right below it. I, I just missed it. So add, for example, uh, has an option that gives you an index and an element. You could pass in an index for the add uh, method and an element. And according to the documentation, this inserts the specific element at the specified position in the list, which is basically this that I did up here with the array list, right? I could go ahead and basically, let's say I have an array list, right? Let's call that array list. Um, and let's say I want to go ahead and do an add function just like that. And then I want to pass in an index, which would be the index zero, and then my string element, which would be one. So basically, this is like the equivalent way of doing it with an array list. So this is why it's important to know how to read documentation. Because like if I was gonna look this up, I, and I might have done it, right? I could have probably looked up a tutorial that shows me how to use array list, and that's fine and all. And you could get a lot of out of the tutorials. But if you want to do something quick, uh, I think it's a lot easier to do so by reading documentation instead of going through, I don't know, a 20-minute video of how to use array list. Now there's definitely no wrong with learning how to use something like the entire thing that's completely fine but often I find it a lot more efficient to kind of just go in here and find exactly what I need in the documentation and then write the code because I know exactly how it works by reading the documentation and so yeah that's reading documentation it really just comes down to knowing the structure of a program doing a lot of searching and just figuring out what you need and the more you do it the easier it becomes and overall you can just find things really quickly it's rare that I actually even look at tutorials anymore like I, I, I mean I don't 
don't remember the last time I actually watched a tutorial for something. It's just, it's not common just because I know how to read documentation and it makes it so much easier just to read documentation and get things done a lot faster. For example, last week I was working on a program uh, using a new framework that I have never used in my life before. And literally within 30 minutes, I had exactly what I needed and built a program I needed. It wasn't hard at all. And that all comes down to knowing how to read documentation. So I can really promise you that if you learn how to read documentation and do it and do it and actually practice it, you'll get to a point where you don't have to look at tutorials anymore just because you have everything you need right in front of you from the documentation and it just gets a lot easier and your, your development time just it's a lot faster. Trust me. It's just the way to go. If you enjoyed the video and you're new here, make sure you go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Uh, also like the video, leave me a comment down below if there's anything else you want to know about. Um, and yeah, go, go, go read documentation and get really good at it. See you on the next one. Peace.